I'd like to welcome you all to this webinar on the management of uh, the first time dislocator. Shoulder dislocations are very common. Uh, the main problem with these uh, dislocations, especially in uh, young patients, is the very high incidence of uh, recurrence. As you can see from these papers, which we've extracted from the literature, uh, especially in the younger patient, and uh, especially in male patients, the risk of recurrence is uh, up to 90%. Lenohumeral dislocations are associated with labral tears, capsular damage, articular cartilage and bone damage, and rarely nerve and rotator cuff damage. There is a much higher instance of developing uh, osteoarthritis later in life if you have a dislocation. The traditional teaching uh, has been that uh, a patient needs to have three or more dislocations in a short period of time to merit operative intervention. But that's all changing. What we were taught when we were younger is we put the patients in a sling for three to six weeks and though evidence shows it makes no difference, they embark on a course of uh, physiotherapy and once their strength has returned, uh, they go back to full activity. If they have recurrences, then uh, surgery is indicated. The real problem with that paradigm is that with each dislocation you get uh, further joint damage and a much higher risk of developing osteoarthritis in the future. It's worth briefly mentioning that if you are going to embark on non-operative treatment, then you're far better off uh, using an external rotation brace rather than a sling where the arm sits internally rotated. And that's because external rotation better approximates the labral tear to the glean. You have a look at these photographs. On this side, on the left side, you see someone in internal rotation in a sling. And you can see the labrum there is a long way from the glenoid and almost certainly won't heal. When you put the patient in external rotation, the labrum approximates the edge of the glenoid and there is a reasonable chance that you might get healing. Uh, it's been shown, especially by Ito, that um, the recurrence rate of someone in an external rotation brace is far less than those uh, held in internal rotation but the follow-up was too short uh, and approximated 12 months. So what are our alternatives? Traditional sling followed by physiotherapy, an external rotation brace, which may or may not work. Arthroscopic lavage, which some people have used in the past, it's never used anymore. A capsular shrinkage where you are uh, electrically uh, shrink the uh, capsule by burning it. Um, that's been shown not to work and there are many complications associated with that. And the two surgical procedures, either an arthroscopic stabilization or an open stabilization with or without a bony transfer, um, are options that are available to the uh, as the editor of Shoulder Arthroscopy said uh, some years ago, historians will likely view our past treatment of traumatic shoulder dislocations as suboptimal. Orthopedic surgeons operate on acute ligament injuries of other joints, but rarely on the shoulder. So what is our aim here? Our aim is to ensure long-term stability to the shoulder and more particularly to avoid further damage to the joint. There was a large study in uh, Scandinavia done by Hevelius uh, some years ago with a 25-year follow-up of a large number of shoulders. 
he found that 56% of these patients had uh, osteoarthritis and 39% of recurrent dislocators who had not had surgery developed arthritis on x-ray, whereas 26% of recurrent dislocators who had surgery um, had osteoarthritis, but the amount of osteoarthritis in this cohort of patients on x-ray was far less than those who hadn't had surgery. And it was clear from this study that there was a higher incidence of osteoarthritis in recurrent as opposed to single dislocators. If you have a look at this video, it's uh, an arthroscopic uh, video of a patient who had a single dislocation. You can see the articular cartilage damage, the humeral heads on the right, the glenoids on the left. It's a very telling video. So what are the uh, advantages of an early shoulder stabilisation? Well, you reduce the risk of recurrence, you reduce the joint, joint damage, you address the pathology, and theoretically, if you do the surgery within six weeks of their first dislocation, the healing potential is at its maximum. All the healing cells which come out with the bleeding are there for about six weeks and the labrum is more likely to heal to the uh, glenoid. So the recurrence rate in first-time dislocators, as we've uh, mentioned, is uh, fairly high. And this is a, these are studies in the recent literature that have compared groups of patients who had non-operative management and they had high risks of recurrence compared to those who had surgery after the first dislocation. And you can see here that the recurrence rate reduced dramatically. Jacobson from uh, Scandinavia also found that those patients at 10 years who had non-operative therapy, about three quarters of them were dissatisfied, whereas those who had had repairs, three quarters of them were satisfied. So which are the high risk patients? Anyone under 25 to 30 years, males are more susceptible to uh, damage and to recurrence than females, and those involved in contact sports, surfing, and overhead sports. And these are the groups of patients that we need to seriously think about uh, considering operative management after one dislocation. So if we have a look at the high risk pathology, you can see in this slide a tear of the labrum here. That's the humeral head, that's the glenoid, and I've got a probe around the labrum and it's come off the uh, glenoid. You can see the blood there from the acute dislocation. This uh, uh, picture is of the back of the humeral head. And this is what's known as an impression fracture or a hill sacs lesion. And those patients who have large hill sacs lesions are more prone to recurrence of dislocation. Patients also get bony damage and lose uh, some uh, bone of the antero-inferior part of the glenoid. And if that happens, your risk of recurrence is higher. And very occasionally, some patients tear the humeral uh, part of the glenohumeral ligament, and that's called a haggle or humeral avulsion of the glenohumeral ligament. And if that occurs, the risk of re recurrence is fairly high. So my approach to these patients is I get a history, I try to find out whether this is a traumatic or atraumatic dislocation, the extent of the trauma, the patient's activity level, whether they're hypermobile, and it's important to perform an anterior apprehension or anterior relocation uh, test as seen here. Try not to dislocate their shoulders when you do that. And it's important to get uh, a number of investigations. Clearly, 
Uh, the first investigation is a plain X-ray. You can see down here, this patient has a bony Bankart lesion, or they've detached part of the antero-inferior glenoid with the labrum. And you can see here a Hill-Sachs lesion, uh, which is uh, a lesion or an impression fracture of the posterolateral corner of the humeral head. I then get an MRI. If they've had the dislocation within 48 hours, there's enough blood in the joint from bleeding to create um, a contrast agent. But if it's over 48 hours, I like to have an intra-articular injection of gadolinium performed so I can have a look uh, with uh, far greater accuracy at the extent of the labral damage. And you can see here, there's a tear of the antero-inferior glenoid. The contrast is leaking around the uh, torn labrum here and here. And you can see the start of a small hill Sachs lesion. If I have a patient who has bony damage, then I always get a CT scan, usually a 3D CT. And here you can see a large bony bank heart lesion where a significant amount of the glenoid has uh, detached with the labrum at the time of the dislocation. If there is bony damage, it's important to determine how much bony damage there is because it does influence uh, the type of procedure you're going to do. Essentially, we need to find out whether there's damage just to the glenoid just to the humeral head or to both, hence the term unipolar and bipolar. If there is only damage to one side of the joint, it's unipolar damage. If there's damage to both sides of the joint, it's bipolar damage. Um, you assess the amount of loss of uh, glenoid articular surface, and um, if it's less than 20% as indicated by this red line here. Uh, that's an important parameter. And you assess the extent of the Hill-Sachs lesion uh, by comparing the diameter. And the bottom line is if you just have damage to the glenoid and it's less than 20%, you could potentially do an arthroscopic uh, procedure. If it's greater than 20%, they need a bony procedure such as a Latage procedure, which we'll discuss a bit later on. If it's unipolar and only involves the humeral head and it's less than 40% of the diameter, you can often get away without bony surgery. But if it's greater than 40%, then you do need to consider bony surgery. A much easier way is to use a system of on-track and off-track. And I know this is all a bit complicated, but essentially by getting a CT scan of the shoulder, you can actually work out mathematically um, whether the shoulder is going to remain on-track and therefore not dislocate or off track and dislocate due to the hill Sachs lesion and the uh, glenoid bony Bankart lesion. And if it is an off track lesion, you need to consider bony surgery. So what is my protocol? Well, if I look at patients who are in a high risk group who are under 30 years of age and have had a single dislocation, once I've done my history and physical examination and, and I've reviewed the uh, radiological investigations, I make a decision. If they have an isolated labral tear on the MR arthrogram, I offer them an arthroscopic stabilization and I usually combine that with a posterior capsule application and I close the rotator interval in contact athletes. If they have a haggle or humeral avulsion of the glenohumeral uh, ligament on MR arthrogram,
I would recommend an open stabilization rather than an arthroscopic procedure. And the reason for that is to get down to the inferior part of the capsule arthroscopically, you can catch the axillary nerve uh, with your sutures because you're doing it from inside out. Whereas with an open shoulder stabilization, you're doing it from outside in and you're viewing directly the axillary nerve. So there is a much higher incidence of an axillary nerve palsy if you uh, do an arthroscopic uh, procedure on a haggle lesion and an axillary nerve palsy can be absolutely uh, devastating to the patient. It's usually permanent. If that patient, even in a high-risk group under 30, has a normal MR arthrogram, then I would consider non-operative treatment, which we'll discuss in a moment. If they have a small bony bank heart lesion and a hill sax lesion, and they are on track, I will do an arthroscopic stabilization plus a remplissage, which we will discuss in a moment, in the non-contact athlete, but I would favor an open stabilization in the contact athlete. If they have a large bony defect and or a hill sex lesion, that is they have unipolar or bipolar bony uh, deficiency and it's an off-track lesion, then I would recommend a latage or a coracoid transfer. How do we do an arthroscopic uh, stabilization? We put the telescope or arthroscope into the joint and we fix up any of the pathology that we see. We do a labral repair where we reattach the labrum back to the glenoid using some anchors with sutures attached and tie the labrum down to uh, ensure that there's healing to the bone. If the capsule has been stretched or if the patient has a hypermobile shoulder, we tighten the capsule at the back. And a remplissage procedure is to put some anchors and sutures into the small hill sac lesion and pull the infraspinatus into that lesion and tighten the shoulder up. With an open stabilization, there are two principles. We repair the labrum back to the bone using sutures through the bone. Um, some people use anchors. I prefer to use sutures, and I'll explain why in a moment. And we tighten the capsule. We make a T-shaped incision in the capsule, and we double breast it to tighten the shoulder. In a latage procedure, we remove the coracoid bone from the coracoid stump and we reattach it to the anterior aspect of the glenoid with two large screws to recreate the bony loss. When we uh, looked at my cases over a uh, 25-year period, you can see um, initially in the 90s, we almost always did open stabilizations. In the late 90s, arthroscopic stabilizations came into vogue as a result of um, significant improvement in instruments and in the type of anchors. And in the uh, early 2000s to 2010, we were doing far more arthroscopic than open stabilizations. And then in the last 10 years or so, we've realized that an arthroscopic stabilization doesn't work in all cases. And we started doing a few more open stabilizations, including latage procedures. Uh, so the take home message here is that we've learned, especially in the last 10 years, that certain types of pathology need different types of treatments. So what are the advantages of open surgery? Well, we've done a lot of work at Prince of Wales Hospital on this. And with open surgery, 
Instead of um, using anchors in many cases, we sew the labrum back to the bone. And with that technique, we can increase the surface area contact of the labrum, labrum and the pressure and enhance healing. We can do a tighter capsule application and we can also address any bony deficiency as well as the uh, haggle lesion if necessary. There have been studies to show that um, doing a primary stabilization uh, is much more cost effective in the long term than non-operative treatment, especially in a young cohort of patients. So in summary, a primary stabilization surgery is more effective than non-operative treatment in patients under 30 years, male patients in particular, high demand sportsmen, and those with labral, capsular, and bony pathology. Early surgery reduces the risk of recurrence. It reduces further joint damage. It leaves a more satisfied patient in the long term, and it's a more cost-effective uh, treatment than non-operative management. The first case is a 20-year-old male who suffers his first dislocation in the surf. He presents with a full range of shoulder motion, no axillary nerve, palsy, and a positive anterior apprehension sign. And you can see on the MR arthrogram that he has a tear of the anteroinferior labrum. He has no significant hill sax lesion. Um, and take it from me, he doesn't have a capsular tear. So we see this man and I talk to him and I tell him that he's young, he's a male, he's active, and the risk of his shoulder dislocation recurring is greater than 90% and with each subsequent dislocation he's going to do more damage to the shoulder and increase his risk of significant long-term arthritis. In this patient I would recommend he undergo an arthroscopic shoulder stabilization and all one would do would be repair the labrum anteroinferiorly if we got in there and we found his capsule was uh, voluminous and a little bit lax, we might do a uh, postro-inferior capsule application. The operation can be done as a day only, but usually as an overnight uh, stay. They're in a sling for four weeks, and uh, once they come out of their sling, I start them on a gentle range of motion uh, program uh, with some TheraBand exercises, but I don't allow them to stretch the shoulder for four months, so they are a little bit tight and some of them lose a little bit of uh, external and internal rotation. I don't allow any lifting more than two kilograms for six months and I don't let them return to any sport uh, for six months. At the end of six months, I assess them. If they've had a, a return of their strength, I allow them to uh, return to uh, full activity. I advise them that the risk of their shoulder redislocating is 5% if they don't return to contact type activities, but the uh, recurrence rate after surgery in contact athletes after one dislocation and an arthroscopic stabilization is about 10%. Some people would say 15%. Case number two is of a 25 year old lady who. Um, had her first time dislocation in a fall while rock climbing. She presents with full movement, hypermobility, positive apprehension, both anteriorly and posteriorly, and a positive sulcus sign.
And if you look at the MR arthrogram, you can see what we term is a Hagel lesion. The normal capsule in a shoulder uh, comes from the bottom of the glenoid and inserts up here into the neck of the humerus. And you can see that the capsule is sitting down here and has stripped off the whole antromedial part of the humerus. You can actually see the neurovascular bundle of the uh, vessels and the axillary nerve. And it's very close to where you want to take the tissue and reinsert it up here. In this patient, I would do an open stabilization because I can see the axillary nerve and push it out of the way with a finger if I needed to. I think the risk of this patient uh, getting recurrence of dislocations if they continue rock climbing is close on 100%. And at the same time, by doing an open stabilization and what we call is a capsular shift to tighten the capsule, we can compensate for her hypermobility by tightening the whole capsule. The third case is that of a 25-year-old uh, rugby league player who sustains a first-time dislocation in a tackle. He presents with uh, limited movement and a strongly positive apprehension sign. Um, the imaging shows that he has bipolar bone de uh, defects, a big hill sax lesion here, some loss of the uh, bone of the antero-inferior glenoid and an anterior labral tear. When you do a three-dimensional CT scan, uh, one is able to tell this is an off-track uh, lesion. The risk of his shoulder re-dislocating if he goes back to playing football, in my opinion, is pretty much 100%. And in this case, because he has an off-track lesion with bipolar bone damage, I would recommend a Latage procedure or a procedure with a coracoid bone graft. Um, most surgeons do it uh, with open surgery. There's there are increasing surgeons performing this procedure arthroscopically. At the moment, the arthroscopic uh, Latage procedure has a higher risk of uh, complications than an open procedure. But as people's technical skills improve with better instrumentation, I suspect in the future most people will be having their Latage procedure done arthroscopically. Um, the rehabilitation from a Latage procedure, whether done open or arthroscopically, is uh, six to nine months. There's uh, often a little bit of uh, added stiffness uh, compared to the uh, simple labral repairs. Um, there is a slight increase in uh, osteoarthritis long term if you have a Latage procedure as compared to other stabilization procedures. Um, so thank you for listening. I hope this uh, talk has uh, been helpful. I wish you uh, a great day and stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you very much.